eight, seven. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this next installment of U.S. Sailing's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Town Hall Series. My name is Stu Gilfillan, and I'm the Education Director for U.S. Sailing. Um, so far, we've had some great conversations, and I'm very pleased to continue that conversation tonight and, and this series with a discussion about adaptive or parasailing. Um, we've got some incredible sailors and individuals from a variety of areas and programs um, who will have I'll have introduced themselves, uh, but first, um, I'm pleased to introduce Becky Kakula, who will be our moderator tonight. So far, we've had uh, great sure. I'm gonna make sure there's no audio in the background. Um, so Becky Kakula is our moderator for tonight. Um, Becky and I have known each other for a number of years. First, when she was a junior sailor up in Hull, um, which she very politely reminded me was not part of the Cape, which I had, had misdirected <laughs> it before. Um, and I was a junior sailor up in Northern Mass. We had a chance to connect there. And then later on, um, we both crossed paths at Providence College and I had the good pleasure of working with her there as a, uh, a collegiate sailor. So I um, was really fortunate to be able to connect with Becky in a number of different ways and really excited to have her here now. Uh, today, she serves as the DEI Director at Disability Inn. Uh, and in her current role, she's responsible for managing the overall DEI program for them. So with that said, um, Becky and to all our panelists, thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to a really great conversation tonight. And um, Becky, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Stu. Thank you everyone for being here. As Stu mentioned, I am Becky Kakula. I identify as a person with dwarfism. So I'm Caucasian, have short brown hair, wearing a black shirt. I'm really happy to be here today with some amazing sailors who also happen to have disabilities like myself. I first started sailing at eight years old in Duplins and Turnabouts. I was really excited to just get on the water. As far as I know, I didn't need any extra accommodations as I was getting into the boat and getting prepared. I think one of the biggest challenges for me was when there was a really windy day uh, weighing enough and being strong enough to hold down the boat and keep it flat. But I just enjoyed participating as much as possible, was on the water all summer, every summer from eight to 18. My father helped me start a sailing team in high school so I could participate in sailing sports. I did that out of community boating in Boston. And then as Stu mentioned, Providence College was on the sailing team for my first two years of college and definitely want to find a way to get back on the water. I haven't been too many times in my adult life, but all of these amazing people on the panel tonight have encouraged me to figure out how to get back in the water and find a way, even if it's just a leisure experience of being on the water. But there are a lot of people like the people on today's panel who love to race. And we wanna make sure that opportunity is available for people with disabilities as well. What we've kind of discussed about leading up to today is that most limits that are perceived are actually not real. And something that we can do together is not giving people rides, it's making people feel empowered to sail independently. And that's what all of the people here today want to have you take away from this conversation, that we just want you to give us a chance to get on the water, whether it's a leisurely sail or we're competing. Give us a chance and you'll see how well we can do. So I'm gonna introduce the panelists or have them introduce themselves. And I've added a few prompts to their introductions. I wanna know who they are. They can provide a visible description of themselves. And how does being on the water make you feel? And how long have you been sailing? So I'm gonna start with Christina. Thanks, Becky. My name is Christina Rubke um, and I am a person with a disability. I use a chin controlled power wheelchair to get around. Um, I have short brown hair and I'm wearing glasses. I'm getting your prompts all in disarray, but I will get to them eventually, I promise. <laughs> um, uh, I think I, uh, how long have I been sailing? That was the last prompt, right? <laughs> okay, I've been sailing for about 12 years and um, I, do, I do both cruising and I've done a lot of racing. And then the last piece is how does it make you feel being on the water? makes me feel happy. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have Matt. 
Uh, my name is Matt Chow. Uh, I'm a sailor who happens to be totally blind. Uh, I am Chinese by heritage, so I, I look, my features are Asian. I have uh, brown eyes, jet black hair, and I'm wearing a light blue long sleeve shirt. Um, I've been sailing for 41 years, and I started back in 1979 through the Carroll Center for the Blind, which had a program called the Outdoor Enrichment Program, which has since been discontinued, unfortunately. Um, and I went from being a recreational sailor to a competitive sailor uh, between uh, then and, and now. Um, I've had the privilege of, of having participated in eight World Blind Sailing Championships, out of which my crew and I uh, received uh, a, a one silver and two bronze medals for our hard work and have also been a six time, uh, my crew and I have also been six time national blind sailing, US blind sailing champs. And um, in addition to that, I've, I've also sailed in mainstream regattas against sighted skippers. Uh, besides doing that, I've had the pleasure of sailing in the Robbie Pierce One Design Regatta for Sailors with Disabilities in which uh, our crew have, has been in the top 10 uh, quite a, a few times. As far as um, how I feel about sailing, uh, I feel a sense of empowerment. I feel a sense of confidence and skill. And the more I sail, the more my confidence develops um, because I'm doing a variety of different, different um, tasks and, and, and doing more advanced uh, techniques and sailing. Love that. Thank you, Matt. Sarah, bring us home. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming and listening to us today. Uh, we're pretty excited about adaptive sailing and my hope that you catch, um, you catch our mojo and, um, and decide to think more about bringing, you know, building sailing in your, in your parts of the world, wherever it is. So my name is Sarah Everhart Skeels. Um, I have, um, I'm a wheelchair user. Uh, I have long curly gray-ish hair. Um, I'm wearing glasses. Uh, I have a pink sweater and I'm coming at you from my home office in uh, Little Compton, Rhode Island. Um, so my history in sailing, I grew up a swimmer, not a sailor. My father sails and put, would put me on a boat every now and again and yell at me. And <laughs> so I didn't grow up liking sailing. Um, but uh, after my spinal cord injury, I was injured in 1990. And in 1992, I had an opportunity to get on a boat. Um, and it was like, whoa, it was the first time I got to steer. And that was um, pretty cool experience again to be uh, being on the water, being around the water, being in the water is just a very freeing experience for me. Um, so in 1994, I decided to actually learn how to sail and I started racing in 1996. Uh, and um, my sailing, I suppose I'll put a career in quotes, but my sailing career has taken me all over the country. And my teammate, um, Cindy Walker and I, I literally traveled the world in a Paralympic campaign for the, uh, the we didn't make it, but we put in a good shot for a Rio. Um, so swim, uh, sailing, finally, sailing makes me feel powerful. It makes me feel happy and it makes me feel free. I love it. You gave me the chills. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to Christina. How did you get into sailing? What kept you doing it? And what ad adaptations do you need while in the boat? So what got into what got me into sailing was I met um, folks from the Bay Area Association of Disabled Sailors. Um, that's a, an organization based in San Francisco, and they um, kind of stopped me on the street and said, "You should come sailing with us. We can definitely hook up a chin control, and you can use your chin to sail. Please, like you should you should try it." And I kind of thought they were probably making it up that I could sail with my chin because I didn't think that was possible, but um, they seemed like an interesting group and fun time. So I, I started sailing with them and I immediately got hooked. Um, it was just so fun. Um, I think especially when I was able to participate more in the sailing, when, when they actually did get a chin control hooked up or a joystick that I could use my chin for. 
So that is one of my adaptations that I that I need on the boat. Um, I don't have used my arms and legs, as I mentioned. And so um, to steer a boat, I use a servo control, um, a joystick that is basically attached to the tiller or the wheel of a boat. Um, and I mount the joystick under my chin. Um, and I can do that. Um, there are these boats that BADS has that's called that are called um, Liberties um, that are manufactured in Australia and that boat I can sail by myself um, because it has two along with the joystick it has two switches that allow me to switch on and off the uh, main and jib so I can adjust those two sails independently as well. Um, the other adaptation I need, I'm a high maintenance sailor, as many of us are, <laughs> I, um, because I don't have too much trunk support, um, I need a seat that, I, that will support me and keep me secure in the boat. Um, so my dad, my parents are awesome and they're very supportive. So my dad built me this great seat that I can basically strap into any boat that I want to sail. Um, so I strap myself into the seat and to the boat and then I'm good to go. Love it. Matt, what about you? Well, uh, for me, um, part of my, my biggest problem is getting to the venue. Uh, I'm fortunate enough that I have my significant other is able to get me to wherever I need to sail. Uh, aside, in terms of, of any adaptations on the boat, um, I really don't need any except for uh, an instructor or a guide who has, who can see and who understands sailing. Um, and in terms of racing, I need someone who is familiar with racing and very competitive. Uh, basically what happens is um, when we sail as a crew, I'm basically the guide's hands. He's my eyes and there's, there's a lot of trust that goes on between the guide or instructor and me. Um, I have to trust him to keep me out of trouble. He has to trust me and that I will do the right thing at the right time as directed. Um, and uh, basically what happens is that we, um, say, you know, as we sail together, as we establish continuity and consistency uh, and race, uh, we have instances where we, we're not just talking about feet in terms of clearances from, let's say, ducking a boat, uh, going across the transom, we're talking inches. Um, we're talking about sailing downwind where um, I can hear the other boat to lure it or windward. Um, and of course, um, I steer a straight course. Um, I'm not rattled, you know, I just learned to focus. Uh, and then when it gets to uh, the roundings, Mark Ryan will say a lured rounding, it gets very interesting. And I can tune out all the yelling and screaming that, of course, happens amongst racers because no, you have room. You don't have room. Yes, I do. <laughs> um, and I just listen to my my guide uh, and make the turn when instructed. You know, we're able to do things like wide and close roundings. Um, and I'm at the point now in terms of my sailing skills where there are times where uh, when I've raced with a spinnaker which is way cool and it's it's quite a rush awesome and how long have you been sailing i've been sailing for 41 years and i've been racing i like to say i've been sailing for 41 and, and really racing for about 26 years because there's a point when you uh when you start sailing you don't realize how much you don't know until you start you know being more competitive and then you find out oh I, I need to learn these skills. Or I need to learn these kinds of techniques. Uh, and once you do that, that's when the that's when the racing really starts. Awesome, Sarah. What about you? So um, I think the adaptations I need. You know, to be honest, in listening to Christina talk about sailing by herself, I have never sailed by myself uh, ever. Um, I don't. It's not that I'm afraid to. It's just I never have. It's always been a something I've always enjoyed doing with other people. And, um, but anyway, um, hats off to you, Christina. I just want to say, and I want everybody to understand just how good of a sailor Christina is and just how of a great sailor Matt is. We all compete against each other sometimes and it's an honor to be on this um, panel with you both. Um, so my, um, because of my spinal cord injury, uh, I need a seat. Um, I would fall out of the boat. I don't have my, um, 
uh, I don't have the use of my legs and, or, or my trunk. So like Christina, I need a seat. Um, I, I steer, I don't trim sails uh, because one of my, it's just not, my strengths are in, in steering. Um, and I, I hope I steer a straight um, course like Matt, that's my goal anyway. Um, but uh, I, I need straps to keep my upper body in so I don't flop over. Um, although they don't always hold and that's always interesting. Um, <laughs> but my seat has never failed me. It always keeps me in. Uh, and I have yet knock on wood to fall out of a boat um, yet. So let's hope that never happens. Um, but that's mostly what I need. And I need help getting in and out of the boat itself. But uh, that can be done with hoyer lifts. It's been done with it doesn't always mean somebody has to pick me. My husband sometimes picks me up. We call it the honeymoon, <laughs> picks me up and puts me on a boat, but that is not the only way to get somebody on a boat. There's lots of ways to get people on boats. So that's sort of the adaptations I need. And um, I need people who are gonna set a race course for me. And uh, yeah, with Matt, uh, allow me to use spinnaker whenever possible. Uh, I would have to say that given the, the three of us, I, I, I think I can say with, pretty high confidence that we we would all trust each other in terms of, you know, if we were put together on a boat, uh, we'd figure out the division of labor and get it done. Yes. I'm coming with you next time. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Sarah, I'm going to keep it with you. L let the audience know a little bit more about just the definition in general of adaptive sailing. Well, my, my definition um, I'll, I'll be clear about that. I am not the Lorax. I do not speak for all the trees. I will speak for my little tree. Um, and I look at adaptive sailing as sailing with adaptations, but I also believe that every sailor sails with adaptations. I don't, I've never met anybody who doesn't own a sailboat, who hasn't set up their lines the way they want them, who doesn't have the tiller that they want, or doesn't have something on their boat that is tweaked out. It's just the way it is. And so I feel like sailing, um, we're sailors uh, with dis who happen to have disabilities, like you said in the beginning, Becky. And so we sail with whatever equipment we need to um, be our best. So we use, Christina uses what she uses, Matt uses what I, what he uses. Um, you know, with, when it comes to seats, we're, you know, sailors are really cognizant of weight. And we try to, you know, our seats are made out of really lightweight material, if at all possible, because obviously you don't want extra weight on the boat when, um, if you want to go fast like me. So, <laughs> but anyway, that's a long answer to your short question. We all want to go fast. It's perfect. <laughs> so Christine, I'll go back to the statement that we talked about earlier. Most limits are perceived, but not actually real. What is a common misconception about someone with your disability when it comes to sailing? I think the most common misconception is just that I can't sail or that I can't really sail or that I can't sail in the way that most sailors think of sailing. Um, you know, maybe they think I'm getting towed around in a, in a small body of water or, um, or I wanna sit and go for a ride which I do because I really like being on the water. So like, I will totally sit on any beautiful boat and go for a ride, let me be clear about that. But um, I much prefer, you know, it's just so much more fun to get in there and, um, you know, actually participate in the sailing. So I think that's a big misconception. Um, I think another one, I don't get this too often, but occasionally people think, oh, isn't that dangerous for you specifically as if it's not dangerous for other people without disabilities? Um, you know, it's just kind of the same level of danger. <laughs> Yeah, those, I would say those are the most common. Uh, Sarah or Matt, do you have anything to add? Well, I think a lot of, um, a lot of people think that, um, and I think goes with almost any, dis because you have a disability, you can't do certain things. And um, in addition to that, um, sometimes we're guilty of putting limits on ourselves mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that, for example, um, when I first started to, race competitively um, in terms of blind sailing, it was thought that blind folks should not be handling the main sheet because that's a safety break for, you know, if you need to come up quick or, or stop. Well, fast forward 15 years later, and uh, we're doing main sheet, traveler, backstay, 
In fact, I will often go out, uh, when I go out to practice, I'm doing all of those things um, and steering uh, without really giving it much thought. So it's just as important that uh, we have an open mind about what we're, about where our perceived limits are as much as um, the public at large. Yes. Yeah, and I, I just I can just re, uh, basically reiterate what both Matt and Christina said that it's it's just this idea um, ableism, this idea that we be based on what people see about us or think about us, therefore we you know we get put in boxes and the boxes don't have dashed lines; they have very solid lines, which makes it hard to get out. Um, which is why sailing so great because you get out the box get out of everything and go out there and just make the boat go um and i think all sailors enjoy that freedom it doesn't matter if you have a disability or not leaving the dock and just leaving everything on shore and getting out there is just so freeing and awesome um but the idea that we don't really sail you don't really sail do you and i've been i've been asked that question point blank but you don't really sail right and i'm not really sure what that and i asked the person what they meant and they were like, well, you know, you don't really get in a boat and go sailing. Well, well, yeah, I do. And then you have to, it's, it's, it's most of the time when you go out and race against someone like that and you beat them that they then come back and they're like, wow, you're right. You really sail. So, so just this misconception of, um, you know, because someone thinks that if they were you, maybe they couldn't do it has nothing to nobody. We are us, whoever we are, we are us. And we get to decide those things. So um, yeah, I, I would love to keep, I would love to shatter. And we're, that's one of the reasons I think all of us are on this panel is that we want to shatter this idea that people can't sail because of a physical, um, because of a physical ability or a lack of ability. That's just not true. Agreed. So Matt, this one's for you. I wanted to ask, what are the best boats that you've sailed as someone with vision loss? And what would you recommend to others with vision loss? Well, um, I've been blind since birth, and um, <clears throat> one of my one of my favorite boats is a J twenty two. I often sail. I sail a lot at Sail Newport, and the reason I like the J twenty two is because there's a lot of feel in the tiller, a lot of feel in the boat uh, as a whole. Um, it's it's very lively. It's not. It's very maneuverable. It's not slow. Um, there, there are no tricks in this boat. You know exactly what's going to happen. You learn to anticipate what the boat's going to do under, under varying conditions. And it's, it's a nice boat. Uh, a lot of people refer to that boat as a, as a D with a keel on it. And I'd have to say that they're right because it's, it's, very, it's very lively, but it's not overpowering. And as long as you know, uh, the boat and know the conditions pretty well. You can you can do a lot of things uh, with it. What about you, Sarah and Christina, for people with physical disabilities? Um, so I I've sailed a lot in the Hansa class boats. They used to be called Access class boats. Um, they have a few different kinds. I've sailed mostly in the Liberty, um, which has a self tacking jib and a weighted centerboard which makes it extremely stable and safe. Um, it has, it's a pretty dry boat, even in pretty, um, you know, pretty high wind conditions. And it can, it can sail in pretty high wind conditions, pretty, you can reef it. Um, it's a great boat for people with physical disabilities because you can sail solo, even if you don't have use of your arms and legs, which is pretty remarkable. Um, and they have a, they have other, they have a, you know, 303, two point. Um, they have a few other boats as well that are really great for, pro for adaptive programs um, just because of the stability. Um, their other boats allow sailors to sit by si side by side, which is really helpful in instruction. Um, I also really like the Martin 16, which I've only sailed once in one race, but it was really fun. Um, I don't know. I liked it. Sarah sailed way cooler, funner, faster boats, <laughs> so she can talk about those. <laughs> Oh, I don't know about that. Uh, but yeah, I think I think uh, for many people, uh, there are a number of adaptive sailing programs around the country who use boats called Freedom 20s. Um, I know the Jug Goldman Adaptive Sailing Program does that the 
um, in Chicago and Bads has them, right, Christina? And uh, Crab used to have them in Maryland. Now they have a different kind of uh, beanie boat, but their uh, Shake Leg Miami has them. Uh, they're, I call them weebles. They wobble, but they don't fall down for anybody who's as old as me who even knows what a weeble is. But um, uh, they have a weighted keel. And so it's, you, it, it won't tip over. And so you can do anything you want to the boat. And they also have seats already in them that allow people to sit in them and use them. So you don't have to have all of your own equipment from the get-go uh, to work for you. So that's a really nice kind of beginner kind of boat if you don't have access to the Hansa dinghies. There's a number of, of lots of programs in the country that use the Hansa dinghies and a, a lot that use Martin 16s. Um, then you get into Paralympic class boats. You have the uh, 2.4 meter, which is a single-handed keel boat. That's a really cool boat. I really want to get in one. Um, not sure if I get in, I'll ever get out because <laughs> it's like a hole, but you know, I'll have to make friends with somebody to say, can you please get me out now? Um, and so that's a single-handed class. It's really big. That's, that's a growing class in this country, certainly in the world. What's really cool about the 2.4 meter is that uh, it doesn't matter if you have a disability or not. There's a huge class. There's a huge group of people who sail it there's no, there is a disability class. Like if you're looking at like world competition, look like from parasailing competition, but you can also go to the world championships for the 2.4 meter and you just sail against everybody. And nine times out of 10, the person that wins has a disability, just saying. Um, but anyway, uh, and then there's um, sonars, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. They're kind of like a Gen 22. They're just a little bit longer, the little beamier, um, they also fly a, um, a symmetrical spinnaker. Um, so those are fun to do in like PHRF racing where you're just getting, you're out there sailing, you're racing with a bunch of different kinds of boats and you get a time, a time like handicap depending on the size of the boat and all that stuff. Um, and then there's like more, there's a specialized boat that's a Hansa boat called a Scud 18 that is kind of a dinosaur now, unfortunately. But to me, that, that boat was a real breakthrough in sailing for those of us with disabilities to compete against each other because it used an it uses an asymmetrical spinnaker, which just makes it so much fun. Uh, Cindy and I could could regale people with all kinds of stories of being on a boat in the Narragansett Bay in five, six, seven foot waves, surfing waves with our kite up and dolphins jumping around us. I'm not kidding. Like it was like a Disney movie, you know, it was pretty cool, but uh, being able to do that, just Cindy and I, two people who can't walk out in the bay in 20, 25 knots of wind, just having the best times of our lives. Um, so that boat is great just to go out and, you know, get some of that speed that everybody needs every now and again. Um, but I think there's boats called Flying Scots, which are also, they tend to be Lake boats, they're also really beamy and you can put uh, seating in those. So that works really well for people with physical disabilities too. So anything that isn't gonna tip over um, readily uh, for someone who's never sailed before uh, is probably the best way to go. Christina, can you talk a little bit more about BADS and if an organization wants to start an adaptive program, what steps would you suggest they take in order to offer sailing to everyone regardless of their disability? So that's like a whole panel discussion in and of itself, but, <laughs> but I'll, do, I'll do my best. Um, yeah, um, BADS here in San Francisco is a wonderful organization. It's been around for 30-ish years. Um, so I was not involved in the founding of BADS. Um, I, you know, I did the easy part. I just showed up one day and started sailing with them. Um, so we at uh, BADS has a keelboat program, a race program, a blind sailing program, and a dinghy program. So it's very comprehensive in the, uh, you know, the different types of sailing opportunities that, are, that we offer. Um, when there's not COVID, um, we have basically, we have, you know, during the summer, we have two to three days of sailing a week, which is amazing. Um, and so it's great. It's, it's very, um, it's really comprehensive and it's a wonderful program and everyone should come sailing with us once it's safe to do so. Um, but in terms of starting a program, I think, you know, I think it starts with just, you know, statistically speaking, most of us know somebody with a disability. It's just, it's a very large group of people in, in the world. And 
I think the best way to start is just ask people to come sailing with your program. You don't need a special boat to get a person with a disability out sailing. You can, you can make adaptations if necessary for that person if they need any adaptations. Um, so just asking people to come sailing that you know that have disabilities. Um, I think um, for sailing programs in general, I think, um, I mean, for you know existing yacht clubs and organizations, I think a big important thing to make sailing welcoming or make their organization welcoming to people with disabilities is, you know, do simple things to make your facilities accessible. Make sure you, you know, if you have a step to get into your facility, put a ramp, things like that, so that people with disabilities feel welcome to, uh, you know, to be there. Um, and then there's all sorts of other things to, like, to think about. I mean, there are very easy, low cost adaptations that one can make to, you know, regular sailboats that you can, you know, you could put D-rings in the cockpit so that people can strap in easily. You can drill um, kind of holes that you can um, put race seats that you can buy, you know, from West Marine off the shelf. You can do all sorts of things that are very doable um, to make your program more accessible to a variety of people with disabilities. Thank you. This one's for all of you, so don't all jump at once. But how can we do better to engage the disability community in sailing? And how can we do more effective outreach to get more people involved? Well, I agree with Christina about there's always there's some if you don't know someone with a disability, there's someone who knows someone with a disability. Anybody who's affiliated with a yacht club or a, a community sailing center, um, you know, there may be older sailors who have decided they're too old to sail again. And, and I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> I really don't. So uh, convincing someone that actually they can get on a boat. I think the um, there's a lot of organizations uh, uh, that serve people with disabilities you can reach out to. There are um, independent living centers. There are local chapters of MS Society. There are spinal cord injury um, support groups. There's all kinds of places to reach out to uh, and get people to come. Uh, that's the first thing is to get people to come. The next thing is to ask them, how do you think, show them a sailboat, bring them down to the dock, show them the boat and say, what do you think the best way is for you to get in? How do you, you know, asking them, asking the person what they might need, not guessing. It's okay. It's in fact vital to ask us about our abilities and it's okay to ask us, in fact, please do. It's not a secret to us what we can and can't do. It might be a secret to you, but it isn't to us. If we, even if we haven't been sailing before, the, the, if you already know everything about sailing and I know everything about my body, you and I can get together and make it happen. Right. Because sailors, again, are the ultimate tinkerers, the ultimate like I've never met a, um, a group of people who like collectively love to just tinker and make stuff and figure stuff out about how to how to improve performance or how to get somebody in a boat, frankly, um, or out of a boat or get them steering. So I think it's it's a just like on a just like you're you know, <laughs> it takes a team to make a boat go if you're in a team if you're in a uh, more than a one single handed boat, the same thing is true in getting someone with a disability out on the water is what do you need to get out there? What can we make? Um, there's an organization, the, well, Matt mentioned it in the very beginning, the Robbie Pierce One Design Regatta was started by a bunch of people who were like at Larchmont Yacht Club and American Yacht Club, shout out to um, Buttons Padine, Siobhan, um, Bill wow. Sandberg and et al and crew. Um, at, uh, that have these ideal 18s. I forgot to mention them. Ideal 18s are a really great little beamy boat. They're like Sonar's little little sister. Um, and uh, they, what Christina said, they went out and they bought these seats. They said to this guy who's our equipment guru, this, this guy named Gene Hinkle down in St. Pete, he knows everything about everything about everything. You just call Gene and he'll figure it out for you um, about an adaptation on a boat. He's been doing it for a long time, but um, Got together and how do we make these things? This is how you, this is what you need to do. You need to get two people in the boat. You need to get them in safely. We literally went to West Marine, bought seats, stuck them in, tied them down, figured it out. Um, over time, we've gotten better and better. They have gotten better at better understanding the best adaptations, which are still just these seats. And uh, there's what, Matt, 30, 30 boats on the line now? We've had 25 to 30 boats on the line. Yeah, so that's a really great example of 
people who didn't really know what was going to happen, but it all worked out really well because it was a collaboration. And, so, and the I, nice thing about the whole Robbie Pierce regatta was that we had a variety of disabilities. We had at one point in one in one uh, regatta we had five blind blind crews, and we had twenty five uh, other boats with with uh, of folks with different varying disabilities, and um, you know we. It's, it's really important that folks with disabilities be united as, as in terms of the sailing community because um, it really makes a difference. Um, you know, there's no one disability that is worse or better than another disability. What matters is that we all go out in the water, compete, and then we have, we talk about the race that got away once we get back on shore. Yeah. And, you know, I also want to be clear, like we happen to all be racers, but there's a whole group of people who are not interested in racing. And while I don't fully understand that, I get it right <laughs> so, for me, but I get it. And I think, you know, when you my first experience on a boat, I literally happened to be going for a ride. But I was um, I went for it was a race. Somebody needed someone to sit in a seat and I was like, I'll do it. Um, I wasn't responsible for anything, but it was, it, you know, getting somebody out and taking them for a sale is a really great way for that to, to get, get somebody to, to get the bug. Uh, and some people aren't going to get the bug, but two out of three just might. And uh, that's what we need is we need those two because then they get two and then they get two. The nice thing about sailing is that you can sail as hard or as easy as you want. There's so many different levels of sailing available from cruising to racing and everything in between. And in fact, uh, Sarah, um, I actually got one of my colleagues from work who both of us are retired. I actually took him out um, for a sale, for a three hour sale, I was doing a practice. Got him back, we came back in um, and as a, um, and I knew he liked it, but as further incentive to really set the hook, I gave him, three hours, two hours of lessons nice. and he he's been hooked ever since and he's he's able-bodied i love it so in this one's for all of you uh, just kind of want to break the ice a little share some fun stories in general, what are the most common questions you get and what questions do you not get but wish people ask? Anything funny you have to say about that experience? Matt's got a good story. Yeah, you yeah, it's like, I, I, yeah, well, I, I actually do. Um, there, I've, I've had people, well, uh, one day we I was in a, uh, Sail for Hope Regatta, which is a charity regatta that's run by Sail Newport and some other clubs. And it's in honor of 9-11. Of and uh, <clears throat> it, during one year, they had a race format where, where it was around the, around the boys race. And so there were multiple races. We, it was in the afternoon. It was probably one of the last races of the day. And we're about a minute from the start. So we're, we're lining up for the start. We're getting into position. There's a J-22 up to windward of us, basically closed the door on us. We couldn't go where we wanted to go. And so my guide said, do a crash tack and a crash jibe. I said, okay. So I slammed the helm over, tacked over, bore off, uh, turned around, swiveled around, sat on the traveler bar, was getting ready for the jibe. And just as we were about to jibe, I heard off in the distance. Oh my God, he's blind. And it's like, oh, no, I, I'm not hearing this. Am I really hearing this? This is, this is a joke, right? No, it was real. So <laughs> I jogged around and I just started laughing like you wouldn't believe. And so much so that, that the tiller was sort of jiggling. I was laughing so hard. And my guide said, what are you, what are you laughing at? And I said, Let's just get off the start line. I'll tell you when we get to the weather mark. And so um, we got to the weather mark. I told him he got a good laugh himself after we bore off and went down the wind. We went back to the, we got, came back into the party afterwards. And one of the line judges came up and said, um, 
and said to us that that was some of the best seamanship she had ever seen. And she said, oh, please forgive the, the she was on a committee boat. And she said, please forgive the, the, the woman who, who basically opened her mouth before her brain. Um, she was just shocked to see that, that, that there was a blind sailor. Um, so yeah, those things have happened. I've actually had another quick story was, um, um, I use a guide dog, uh, a seeing eye dog. And, um, we had a, they, they sent a photographer up to do some shots and he went on to practice with, with, uh, one of the sailor Newport instructors and, and, and me. And, um, we were coming in to, uh, to the harbor, to the, Sail Newport, and if you know, well, there's a seawall at one one end, and you have to make a 90 degree turn and go and head up in into the Sail Newport anchorage, and so the the photographer said, "Hey, we're gonna hit seawall. Hey, we're gonna hit seawall," and I and I said, "Shut up! I'm driving. I'm busy," <laughs> and. And my instructor, I, I'm sure she wanted to cut it close just, just to shut him up. We probably came to within about five feet of the wall and they said, head up now. So I did a sharp 90, we came up, got in there and hit the mooring on the, uh, you know, caught the mooring on the first pass. So that's what you can do when you have good, good crew work, good teamwork going. In spite of the fact that I couldn't see anything that's how you that's how we get it done yes any stories from sarah or christina i think i think just going into the point of what questions do i wish people would ask um and what questions they ask i find a lot of people want to ask me a lot of questions about me and my my abilities and 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 how amazing i am and and i don't frankly find myself particularly amazing. I find myself very fortunate that I was able to access resources or that I, you know, that allowed me to sail uh, or that I, that I've been in a community that has had the open mind um, and the attitude of let's get you on a boat all the time versus wait, we can't do that. You know, it's not safe or something might not happen. I'm not sure what's going to happen, but um, so I think I'd rather talk to people about my, about like Matt says, just about racing. Um, you know, why'd you make that bonehead move <laughs> or every now and again, wow, that was a great start. Um, you know, or just questions about, about what we're both interested in versus making it about me. Um, I'd like to make it about the experience, I think. And so, and I have, I have lots of stories, but, um, I just, I just want to leave everybody here with, I just want everybody to understand how important this sport is for those, for everyone. And this is the one sport, the singular sport, the one singular sport that doesn't change. It doesn't change no matter who's on the boat. It doesn't change. It's the same sport. Maybe we're sitting in a seat, but we all use a, use a tiller of some kind. Christina has a chin drive that, could, that works on a servo that is connected to the tiller. She can't control the boat without the tiller. Everybody uses a tiller, right? How you get to that tiller is anybody's business. Um, everybody, you know, Matt sits backwards on the boat sailing downwind. He, he's looking aft. It takes a little while to get used to, but then you realize, of course he does. Why? It makes all the sense in the world, right, everybody? Where's the wind coming from? That's why Matt can pick up that shift, right? Because he's feeling it, wherever you feel it, Matt. Um, but, you know, it's, it's about that. Let's talk about that kind of stuff, because to me, that's the big conversation. And how do we, how do we keep how do we get more people sailing and understanding that this, this sport, we are literally all in the same boat. <laughs> yes. And, and sailing, <laughs> sailing is both an art and a science. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of creativity that goes on. Sailors, you're, you're right. Our problem solvers, tinkerers, they have to be because if they race their tacticians, so they got to figure stuff out. And that includes us. I just want to add that, Sarah is amazing and it has nothing to do with her disability. <laughs> Aww. Aww. Thanks, Christina. Well, I think we are all a little bit curious about Christina's adaptations in the boat 
and we happen to have some photos. So we'd love to kind of walk start screen share. Those. You are viewing still. <laughs> yes, I can explain what some of this is. Um, the left side photo is um, a picture of a wooden seat. I'm trying to describe it as well for Matt um, uh, and anyone else who needs the description, but it's a wooden seat and it has some padding inserted. We use some REI. I'm not being sponsored, unfortunately. Um, but, um, some REI equipment to make it a little bit more comfortable so I don't my butt doesn't get sore while I'm racing. Um, we put those, we actually put those front sticks to tilt the chair back a little bit because on the Martin 16, if I didn't have the seat tilted back, the boom hit me in the head or almost hit me in the head or it was too close to my head to make me comfortable. <laughs> um, but that seat I can drop into pretty much any boat, I've, you know, um, and you can see it here. This is in the RS Venture in Newport um, at the Claggett. Um, and this was um, the first time I had sailed this boat, but luckily it fit right into the seats that were already on the boat. And then um, both in both pictures, you can see the joystick, um, which the joystick came as part of the servo kit for the RS Venture. Um, and we, my dad and the RS Venture guy uh, helped kind of put it together in a way that worked for me. I think we rotated the joystick so that we could mount it on this totally um, handcrafted <laughs> type of uh, mount. Um, I think that's like a clipboard and some random supplies that we found around the harbor. Um, and we we got put that all together and that is how I sailed the RS Venture um, with my crew member, Chris Sheppy, who is a blind sailor, who is absolutely one of the best sailors out there. And the only reason I've ever been successful in double-handed races. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with us. Stuart Gilfillan has stopped screen. <laughs> so I do have a question around just what sailing programs have you seen do the best job getting new sailors on the water? And is there a secret sauce? Well, I think the secret sauce is the attitude. Um, I, I love that. I love the idea of a secret sauce and everybody has it. That's the beauty. We all have secret sauce. And it's, it's that, uh, I don't wanna sound all like Pollyanna here, but it is about um, the, how are we gonna make it happen versus how are we, why, why we can't make it happen. Of uh, This idea of why can we make this happen and how can we make this happen? And maybe it'll take more than a day, you know? Um, you know, Christina's dad and Christina figured out her seat. Somebody who hasn't ever sailed before uh, and needs a seat might take more than a day to figure out what they need. But it's about going back and forth to the hardware store, uh, going back and forth to West Marine to figure out just what you need. Again, you talk to any sailor, they know where West Marine is. They know where more than one West Marine is or, you know, any other similar place like that. We're not sponsored by West Marine either. Um, but uh, but I think that's, I think that the special sauce, I think about this all the time with, with, with um, accessibility in general, it's about attitude, really, to me, it's about let's find a way to get you in, let's find a way to get you on whatever, let's find a way to get you to access whatever you need to access, it's the same thing, um, that's the special sauce. Um, and I said before, you know, there's, there's all these programs across the country, people don't even know, there's a really great program called Why Not in, on Lake George and in, um, in um, upstate New York. And uh, Spencer, shout out to you. Spencer Reggio is very involved in that um, organization. They are, they're like the Y camp that also happens to have an adaptive sailing program attached to it. So um, they, they do it well. They use Martin 16s and they, they have a sonar. Um, there is, as I said, the Judd Goldman um, program, adaptive program uh, in Chicago. Um, there is BADS, of course, of course, Christina's organization. There's the Galveston Sailing Center down in Galveston, Texas. There's Shake a Leg Miami. There's, a, there's programs. There's two, two adaptive programs in Boston, right, Matt? Community yep, there's, uh, there's community boating in Pierce Park. And there's, um, there's a community sailing center in, uh, on Lake Champlain up in Vermont. Uh, there is, I think Sail Maine is trying to start up an adaptive program. 
Um, it, it's it's getting in the water. There's a there's a sailing for all in in Provincetown on the Cape, get Becky, that that has a sonar, and they're trying to make something happen there. So um, I believe there's a program in Tennessee. Uh, there's the there's the C. Thomas Claggett Memorial Regatta uh, in in Newport, and we also do a match race at the Oak Cliff Sailing Center in, on Long Island. Um, there is, I don't know, fill in where I've forgotten everybody. There's so many programs where people can go and try to figure out what works best for them. Okay. There's C's in Sheboygan. Yep. That's another one. Sheboygan. There's Footloose oh. in Seattle. Footloose in Seattle. Oh, and though, um, San Diego. Um, That's right. Ooh, challenge, challenge yeah. sailing, I think. Yeah. Challenge sailing. Yeah. Challenge. That's what it is. I think U.S. sailing has a list. Uh, I think you can just. Call you I'm so to ask that. But where can people find all these great programs? And if, if US Sailing doesn't have, have a list, we just put them on the spot to create such a list. <laughs> right. I think they do, but you know, there's a program in Michigan, Traverse in Traverse. Traverse. Michigan. Yeah. It's just it's about looking, go everybody, go back to your sailing center, look at a boat and see, whoa, it actually this this um flying scot looks really like it'd be a great boat. Um, ideal 18, there's, a, there's um, the Capri, Capri 24 is in California that we've sailed. All these, anyway, just any beamy-ish boat. Um, and then it's like, well, what do you do? How do you get people on it, off it, figuring out all those things? But these are things you figure out every day. We do have a question from the chat box from Betsy Allison. How do we change the mindset of the clubs so orgs that think it's too difficult to get involved. We just start showing up and forcing them to sail with us. <laughs> no, no I mean, um, I actually uh, went out to visit my mom one year and I wanted to go sailing. And I went to a um, sailing club out there. They, they never had a blind sailor. Uh, I got linked up with uh, one of the instructors. And it was very interesting because it wasn't just, well, we'll let you, we'll take you out for a ride. It was like, what do you know? What can you do? Uh, how much of you, what kind of experience have you had? To the point where um, she actually said, well, you're gonna take the boat out. And that includes starting the engine, backing the boat out, you know, and steering out into the cha channel. And, um, that was the first time that um, I actually had someone who, so a lot of it's on, on the part of the instructor to have that kind of uh, creativity to think outside the box as much as it is for the person who has a disability. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I knew it was pretty exciting. I took a, a Pearson 26 out, you know, under guidance and then brought it back in, you know, turned off the engine, hoisted the sail, started steering, you know, uh, sailed for two hours and came back in. And they never had, they never had a blind sailor. You know, and I think, you know, thanks, Bets. Hey, Bets, nice, nice to um, know that you're watching. Um, Betsy Allison is responsible for me getting into racing. Um, anyway, I'm sure she's responsible for lots of people getting into racing. Um, but I, th I think that it's, if you're a community sailing center, and you're always looking for more people to come pay and enjoy, pay for and enjoy your services. <laughs> Our money is just as green as everybody else's the last time I checked. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't like hard cash, Venmo, whatever it works. And our money is just as good. Um, it's not disabled. Um, I think that thinking about a you know, building a consumer base, there's one in, what is it? One, Christina, one in every four people in this country identifies as, as disabled or something. That's a large <laughs> It's a large group of people, 20%. Uh, and then, you know, to yacht clubs who are like, well, we're not looking for more people. For yacht clubs, I bet there are people uh, who are family members, friends of your membership who would love to experience sailing. I and mean, it's, it's, it's a kick to share. I, I, one of my favorite things to do is to get on a boat with somebody with a disability who's never been on a boat before. I, it gives me shivers just thinking about it, just talking about it. It is, I teach adaptive sailing. It's the same thing. I mean, skiing, it's the same thing. Like 
I can't do that anymore or I can't do that. And really, are you sure? And then you get them on a boat and it's like you get to see somebody smile for real, like for real, for the first time that you cannot put a price on that. And what if you get to do that over and over again? Like, why wouldn't you? <laughs> I guess that's my question back is, you know, if it's not worth it, why? Why wouldn't it be worth it? Why wouldn't it be worth giving this gift? Um, and it's not like you're doing something for someone. You're doing something for yourself. The way I look at it, you're you're sharing something that you love with someone else who's going to love it too. I also think like yacht clubs who are trying to get um, local governments to provide better facilities, negotiating those types of things with local governments and um, kind of local coastal agencies. Um, get a lot of benefit for saying that they have an adaptive program because that it gives them that public access hook. And it really does I mean, when you have those types of facilities, there is kind of these obligations to provide public access and you're gonna be more successful in lobbying for better facilities and different kinds of government um, you know, help. So I think that's another kind of just selfish reason to do it. Yeah. That was good to have a lawyer in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I also think that as, as the popul population ages, there are going to be more folks with disabilities who, who do want to have uh, continue their pastimes that they've had when they were able-bodied. And I think that's another thing to tap into down the road um, because you're going to have a, a more of a population that's, that's senior. I hate to say it because I'm one of them now. Um, who want to get out in the water. And I think it's, it, it, it's a good opportunity for us to spread the, send the message. I agree. And I think Sarah made a great point earlier that it's sailing, no matter what, who's in the boat or what adaptations are needed. I think there's often hesitation if someone acquires a disability later in life, that they're not going to be able to still participate in their favorite sports and this is our time to continue this amazing conversation. It doesn't stop here. We want to continue to make people with disabilities feel empowered to get out on the water and clubs to feel innovative, to be more inclusive. And as Christina mentioned, make sure your buildings are accessible as you're navigating how to be more inclusive of sailors who happen to have disabilities. So I can't thank you all enough Christina, Matt, Sarah, it's been an amazing conversation and let's keep it going. And we're getting on the water all together once COVID ends. Amen, sister. Absolutely. Well, I, um, I'm back and I, I wanna sort of echo what Becky had said and say thank you to all of you. Um, great conversation tonight, as we said with a number of our other DEI panels as well. This is really the, the beginning of this conversation and we'll continue to go. And I, I hope to see all of you back again um, on this conversation or another one a little bit later on in probably 2021. So a um, couple of just notes to follow up with for folks. This is going to be recorded. If uh, you want to go back and review it, it'll be on the Starboard portal. Um, there were a couple of resources that have come up that I'm just going to share so folks can check it out. Has started screen share. Uh, first one is the Adaptive Sailing Resource Manual, which was developed in conjunction with World Sailing uh, and a whole host of volunteers played a role in this. Um, Sarah was one of them. There's a couple of great shots of her uh, and how transfers work in that. And Betsy Allison, who um, uh, we're grateful to have on board watching tonight and was answering some questions, who's U.S. Sailing's adult director and contributed a lot to that particular manual. So it is a free resource. Um, you can go to that URL and download it. Uh, we do ask for your information just purely so we know who's downloading it. We're not selling anyone's info. Um, and we will also put the link to that and the other resource in here in the Sailing Leadership Forum uh, Facebook group that we have. Uh, the other one in here is one that Christina had shared with us, which is called That's How We Roll. It's a video series, very cool. Um, and the particular episode that this link goes to highlights BADS, her program. Um, and I, I believe, Christina, you got a cameo in there too. It's a whole piece with you, which is pretty cool. <laughs> so definitely check that out. Um, and lastly, as we go forward, we've got one more town hall panel this year that will be on December 10th at 7.30 p.m. Um, we are collaborating, U.S. Sailing is collaborating with the Intercollegiate Sailing Association's uh, Inclusivity, Diversity, and Equity Task Force, TIDE. Um, and we've got panelists that include current and former collegiate sailors, as well as college coaches and Olympians, um, and should be a really dynamic 
conversation that focuses around culture so and culture change. So that's December 10th at 7.30 p.m. Um, please make sure that you, you don't miss it. We'd love to have you there and, and join us as we finish up the year on a strong note. Um, so again, I, I wanna say thank you to all our panelists. You guys are awesome, really appreciate your time. Thank you to everybody that joined us tonight. And um, I hope everybody has a safe and happy Thanksgiving. So with that, thank you all and have a good night.